those next presentations by Carolyn Funk and some co-authors, and they're going to be talk, talking about archaeological faunal assemblages and partnering with those with modern data to tell the story of mercury contamination in the Aleutian Islands. Hi. All right, am I all set? I think so, yeah. Hey, yep. okay. good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well today. Um, I'm the presenting member of, uh -oh, my computer has just locked up, but we'll hope for the best here. Am I still with you? Yeah, we can still hear you. Yep. Okay. Uh, excuse me for just a moment. There we go. All right, I'm the presenting member of an inclusive collaborative research team focused on mercury dynamics in the Aleutian Islands. And all of us appreciate your time today. Archeological faunal assemblages truly are repositories of environmental data. This is culturally mediated environmental data and accessing the information requires a really diverse collaborative team. We operate together to produce new understandings that aren't going to be limited by academic partitions or academic exclusion. Uh-oh, I'm so sorry. I'm having a little trouble with my slides here. Let me attempt to situate myself. Scott, is there a chance that you can do slides? Yes, I am bringing it up right now, actually. I can't even stop my screen share at this point. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Okay, is that up for everybody? Um, can you can you turn off my video for just one moment? I'm I'm having a technical situation. I'm so sorry for this. This never happens. My mouse okay. is not working. All right, I'm swapping out my mouse. I got the other one. I am back again. Okay, excuse me, everybody, for that trouble. All right, so if you could switch to the next slide, Scott. Um, yeah, just one second. All right, so today, after a technical delay, um, introducing our new five-year project, and I'm gonna report in on some early progress. This is fairly hard one early progress that we've made wholly during the pandemic. And with this presentation and in our coming years of work, we are deliberately and intentionally inviting comment and contribution from Unanga community members and anyone else with collaborative interests. The lead members of the research team are Julie Avery, Nicole Massardi, Lori Ria, and myself. And we share a common interest in identifying long-term patterns to form understandings of current cultural, environmental, and ecological situations and modeling future outcomes. I specialize in the culture-focused archeological research, including zooarchaeology. Nicole focuses on environment and ecology through chemical analysis of faunal materials and Julie and Lori focus on patterns in historical and contemporary sea mammal health and well being. Our broad research team include, includes archaeologists from the Museum of the North at Fairbanks and three other repositories NOAA marine mammal specialists, volcanologists, laboratory research staff, graduate, undergraduate students. Um, there's room for more. This team will grow as we identify the research needs and as any stakeholders or interested parties come forward. Could you go to the next slide? So what we're doing is we're looking at mercury. 
Mercury is one of the top 10 contaminants of concern for human health. Uh, it's a contaminant of concern for all members of an ecological community. In our study, we focus on three sentinel species, cod, sea lions, and fur seals. Mercury is in our world. It's always been in our world. Um, inorganic mercury is introduced to water and eventually to coastal systems. Uh, it's methylated by microbes into something called monomethyl mercury, which is the more neurotoxic form of mercury. It's also biologically accessible in the food web. Predators, um, prey species consume the mercury and it bioaccumulates in their systems. Predator species eat the prey species and it, the mercury biomagnifies in their bodies. So um, fish eating predators show a greater mercury exposure in general in our studies, focuses on three of the long lived fish eating top predator species in the Aleutian Island food web. This is important to understand that chronic mercury exposure, even low doses of it can have fairly long lasting effects on individual members of a population and on broader scale population dynamics. These negative impacts include reduced health, impaired cognition, decreased pup survival, and lower reproductive rates for these sentinel species. And importantly, the amount of mercury available for bioaccumulation and biomagnification changes over time. And we're looking at archaeological materials and historical faunal samples to look at changing patterns in mercury levels over three to 4,000 years in the Aleutians. And as we tra track the patterns and learn more about broad scale food web implications, we should all be really glad that the Inanga village middens exist. Bone is an ideal tissue for long term mercury studies because mercury stores in bone throughout an organism's lifetime. All of us know here, sitting in this conference, that um, archaeological bone preservation in the Aleutians is remarkable. Bone's also ideal because it provides two distinct windows of time in every sample. We have compact bone, which is the outer exterior bone. It remodels very slowly. Um, and spongy bone, the fresh new developing bone inside, remodels very quickly. So we get two windows of mercury accumulation in the long and short term of an organism's life. Next slide, please. This is an important study because most people intuitively believe that the fluorescence of industry in the last few hundred years introduced new and really productive sources of mercury into subarctic and arctic atmospheric and coastal systems. And we approach the test of this intuitive assumption with two contrasting perspectives and one coupled more likely scenario. First, mercury has always been present. And if this is so, high levels of mercury should be identifiable in, identifiable in archeological faunal bone through the 4,000 year time span. Um, we expect mercury to vary over time and space. And second, mercury is new to the Aleutians. If this is true, mercury accumulation in Aleutian Island sentinel species um, is an anthropogenic phenomenon, and we expect to find high mercury levels in post-industrial faunal samples almost exclusively. But the more likely coupled perspective here is that mercury is always been present and there's increased recent accumulation. If there are high mercury levels in periods associated with natural inputs, with no past oscillations that approach high modern levels, then mercury dynamics in the Aleutians may currently be experiencing synergistic amplification of anthropogenic and naturally derived mercury. So let's think about where mercury is coming from. Next slide. We really predict that mercury content of these top predators are going to vary even in pre-industrial times in cooler versus warmer climate regimes. Um, this is in part because naturally occurring inorganic mercury stored really effectively in permafrost. 24% of the north is permafrost. In past times, warming periods and subsequent flows of permafrost sediments into northern waters may have released an influx of naturally occurring inorganic mercury and methylated mercury into ocean ecologies. If this process was in play in the Aleutian Islands, and a sample study that focused on cod by Murray et al. in the nearby Gulf of Alaska suggests that it was, um, we should expect to see cycles of rising and falling mercury levels in our sentinel species that follow rising and falling temperature climate regimes. Next slide. 
We also suspect that mercury content of top predators will vary uh, in pre-industrial times because of volcanic eruptions. Volcanic emissions contribute inorganic mercury and uh, the tephra record of the Aleutian Islands is still in development. So unfortunately, that's, that's problematic for us. As we work through our mercury analysis, we're gonna find ourselves concentrating on developing stronger histories of volcanism if, if we find patterns showing episodic high mercury levels in the past. Next slide, please. And of course, and, um, industry is depositing significant mercury into our global systems. The difficulty we face, everyone faces in the world who's doing this kind of work, is that industrial mercury, volcanic mercury, and presumably mercury preserved in, in permafrost can't be sourced. It, it can't be determined where exactly it came from. So identifying mercury in the bones and hair of these ancient and modern sentinel species doesn't tell us where it came from. We know that there are mercury hotspots in the Western and Central Aleutians today as measured in stellar sea lion pups by team member Luri, Ria, and, um, and in fish as measured by Sierra et al. in 2019. But the source of these hotspots, industrial culture, volcanism, or climate change remains unknown. And our third coupled hypothetical perspective is the most likely explanation here, but it's challenging to parse this into modes of causality. We have to try. Coastal communities and Arctic communities uh, are especially vulnerable to impacts from long-term high-level mercury exposure because of their reliance on aquatic ecosystems. In the Aleutian Islands past, the species ancestral Nunga relied on for food and material goods likely were negatively impacted during high mercury oscillations. Sea lions, fur seals, cod, were and are fundamental in Ananga traditional harvesting, and in the case of cod, are fundamental to economic security, even today. The simplest level, there probably would have been fewer of these key resource species during phases of high mercury levels. We know that the chronic exposure can call it, cause issues in sea lion first seal fertility, pup survival, foraging capacities. If there were surges in mercury contam contamination periodically in the past, there would have been periods of time when there were fewer stellar sea lions and northern fur seals. These species were food resources, so an obvious outcome would have been a decrease in food supply. But also, their skins were the primary covering material for ETEC. We have to consider what happens to a village when their transportation used to move people to hunt and importantly, to serve as a fundamental part of men's lives becomes too difficult to obtain. Difficult possibly for generations. So we're in the first year of this study and we don't have ample data to share with you or conclusions to draw just yet, but some of our early results, which I'm gonna talk about in a moment, suggest we need to start thinking about profound implications for cultural well-being in the past. And we welcome partnerships with Native community members as we work through these broad questions. Next slide. We're working towards five specific goals in our project. Um, these should lead us to a better understanding of mercury dynamics. And to achieve them, we're sending samples and information along a carefully orchestrated data pipeline. At the base, we're acquiring samples from two kinds of data sets. We're sampling archeological sentinel species, faunal materials from ancestral Ilunga village middens throughout the Aleutians. These faunal materials are housed in four different repositories, two in Alaska, one in DC, and one in Paris, France. And we're planning a field season to Agatu Island to excavate in one midden site because the Western Aleutians are a hot spot and Agatu has been a locus for modern sea lion health studies. And two, we're sampling historic and modern hair, blood and bone of the sentinel species from collections housed in repositories in Alaska and DC. The richness and abundance of these two data sets means that this is the largest study of its kind anywhere in the world largest in terms of sample size, largest in terms of regional breadth. We're testing hundreds of samples from sites right across more than 1,600 kilometers spanning 4,000 years. So previous studies that demonstrated that this is feasible um, focused on single sites and had small sample size, like Murray et al. in 2015, who I mentioned earlier, tested 53 cod bones um, and 60 modern tissue samples. 
Evelyn et al. Um, in 2019 reported hair specimens from nine ancestral mummies in the uh, Aleutian Islands. So we're growing um, the base of knowledge. Next slide, please. We awarded this NSF grant less than a month into the pandemic shutdown and our project has been able to move forward despite this because we were we were we began with archaeological materials housed at the Museum of the North and because a large part of the research team is based at UAF. Nicole and Julie along with Josh and Scott and all of the lab and museum personnel at UAF have been able to sort identify and sample materials from the eastern and central Aleutian Islands. Once the faunal materials from the target species are sorted and identified from the midden collections, we calculate MNI. These analyses are based on individuals, not specimens, not NISP. Uh, and the isotope analyses and mercury assays are performed on well-preserved elements of individual animals. Next slide, please. All of the analyses use only two to three grams of compact and spongy bones, which we remove from the well-preserved areas of the sample elements with grinders and then with micro drills. And we extract the collagen for the spongy bone and compact bone samples to do stable carbon and nitrogen analyses. The variations in carbon-13 and nitrogen-15 are gonna give us information about variations in the food base of the food webs changes in primary productivity, and shifting trophic positioning of species over time and space. The dynamic context of the food web is linked to shifting environmental conditions and perhaps mercury levels. Over summer and fall, Ms. Sardi and her lab uh, analyzed 90 new specimens from the collections housed at UAF, um, focusing on Sanak and Kiska Islands. It's, it's too early for modeling, but there'll be more about this in the coming years. Uh, the mercury analysis follows the isotope analysis um, uh, led by Julie Avery, the PI of the project in the Meta Lab at UAF. Uh, she performs these tests on the bone, not the collagen that's been extracted. It's important and interesting to note that the mercury content of compact bone, the lifetime accumulation, might be lower than that of the spongy bone uh, formed within the last three years of death. All right, Avery and her crew analyzed about 70 of the samples that started in Masardi's lab, and this is very exciting. They were using in the metal lab the new Milestone DMA. This is a direct mercury analyzer. Uh, uh, no, that's the old one. We have a new machine. It's the high sensitivity Nippon MA 3000 instrument purchased by the award for UAF and it can detect mercury at quantities 100 times smaller than what was possible with the older machine. So our study is uh, large in scale, but also capable of new detail as we move forward in the next few years. Next slide, please. Uh, Julie Avery and some of the other folks in the project reported on some very early data last fall. Uh, this is a slide of samples from uh, Snack Island in three different time periods. And you can see there's a wide range of mercury from 8 to 1640 parts per billion over 4,000 years. And the spongy bone is providing the widest variation. Remember, that's the later in life accumulation. The greatest mercury levels were observed in specimens from about 3,500 years ago. It's a highly active period of volcanic eruptions, and it's tempting to compare the higher mercury levels in the 21 to 4,000 years, 2100 to 4,000 years ago range to cooler climatic regimes, but it's all premature. None of these associations have statistical significance, and we'll learn more as we go forward. Next slide. Four more years of work are coming on this project. You can learn more about the different perspectives emerging from our collaboration next month at UAF's One Health, One Future 2021 online conference. And we do warmly welcome you to contact us if you're interested in learning more about the project or cooperating with us. The new webpage is open in soon on the UAF Metal Lab website. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. That was fascinating. Uh, we're going to move on to the next presentation. If you have questions for Carolyn, 
uh, please hold them till the end of the session.